Ethan's not going to be entirely happy, but I thought it would be best if I didn't sit here and read off a piece of paper um, to introduce Professor Henderson. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, uh, my name is Tom Sakata. I was the president of the College Republicans, but now, and now I'm the president of the Young Americans for Liberty. Um, I've done a lot of crazy things here. Uh, I write about, which is very pertinent to tonight's lecture, uh, I get to write about intellectual diversity for Breitbart News. Um, so I get to every single morning wake up and look at the news and see what's going on at colleges around the country and see uh, if students are actually being challenged, um, if their professors are actually pushing them, if they're just patting liberal students in the back. Um, just, I think it was just yesterday I wrote a story that you guys can check out um, about Cornell. Somebody did a study and found that 11 of the 19 academic departments at Cornell have zero registered Republican professors. Um, I try to, when I, when I go about this the topic of intellectual diversity, I try to do it from an entirely neutral standpoint. I'm, I, I'm not a registered Republican myself, um, but I totally understand and believe in the importance of genuine intellectual diversity uh, in the American Academy. I think it was, it's part of the foundation, it's the reason why we go to school to learn, to challenge, to think about the things, especially the things that we don't agree with. Um, that's why I think it's so important every time we have a lecture, whether it's somebody crazy like Milo, or somebody a little bit more serious and intelligent like Professor Henderson, um, that we make sure everybody who can comes out here and listens to it, or even if it's um, on Ethan's awesome recording after the fact. Um, so I'm super excited for tonight. Uh, this is actually very important because the book that Professor Henderson has uh, criticized, Pickett's book, is actually a popular book that's assigned here <laughs> in our economics department, something that I had been assigned, something that I had to work with, and really didn't get to uh, hear the other side. So it's really cool that we're, we're going to do this. Um, Professor Henderson is an award-winning writer who write, uh, pens the uh, No Panacea blog at Forbes.com. He's a professor at Grove <laughs> City College. He's been the author of hundreds of articles that have been published around the world. He has written five books, the most recent of which is Problems with Piketty, the Flaws and Fallacies in Capital in the 21st Century, which is a critique, critique of the very popular uh, uh, book by a French economist Thomas Piketty, uh, which was an international bestseller. Um, you guys probably see it when you go to local bookstores. <laughs> but it is my great pleasure. I'm going to just shut up um, to introduce Professor Mark Henderson. Thank you, Tom. Delighted to be here with you tonight. I'm going to start with an icebreaker question. And I realized when I gave this talk at another college here in Pennsylvania a few weeks ago, about half the people didn't answer, and I thought, gee, it wasn't a very difficult question. And then I realized, you know, we live in an age where everybody's playing gotcha, you know, and you're, you're wondering, is this a trick question? I assure you it's not a trick question. It's a, it's a very simple one. We've we got a serious topic to talk about tonight, and I'm not going to turn it into a joke or anything. I just want to know how many of you would be comfortable with public policy moving in a direction where the poor people in America have greater uh, possibilities of economic advancement. How many of you are comfortable with advancement for the Okay, thanks. You know, it, it doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat or conservative or liberal. I mean, there are certain things as human beings that we have in common, and it would be a, a very rare and, and sad human being who would just say, oh, nuts to the poor, they got enough, leave them alone, keep them there. You know, none of us here feels that way. And the egalitarians have a different approach from from my own, as you'll see. Um, let, let, let me tell you how I really got hooked on this, uh, the whole concern with, with poor people. I had to go abroad, really, to do it. I grew up in a suburb of Detroit, and it was very um, homogenized, I guess you would say, very middle class. And I didn't really have any face-to-face -face encounters with severe poverty until I was an undergraduate, and I studied abroad, first in Mexico and then in Colombia. And when I was a 19-year-old in Bogota, Colombia, I'm walking around the streets and there are these little clusters of street urchins, maybe a dozen, 15 of them, little kids, you know, three, four, five, maybe seven, eight, nine years old, something like that. And in every one of these groups, it seemed that there was a little boy minus a foot, and only had one foot and was hopping around with the help of a crude cane or a crutch. And, and I thought, how did this happen? Because I didn't, there weren't any trolley tracks or anything like that. I thought, what's this epidemic of missing feet? So after I was there a couple of weeks, my curiosity got the best of me, and I asked one of the locals, I said, why are there so many of these street kids that are minus a foot? And I was told, can anybody anticipate the answer? 
hope that's an important call over there. <laughs> yeah. That, you know what? I didn't turn mine off either, thanks for the reminder. That was good. I'm, I'm still new to the smartphone thing. I, I've got a smartphone, what it needs now is a smart user. The, the answer is, the parents of these child, children would, would lop off the foot before abandoning the child on the theory that a main child would be more likely to obtain pity and be kept alive than, than a whole child. Now, I'm not sure how valid that theory was because I never did notice a one-foot adult in Colombia. But that pierced my soul. Uh, I actually went radical for a few years. I was a raving socialist by the time I got out of college. Today, I'm more on the free market side, but I, I, I've never lost that concern for the poor. That still motivates me. I'm just one of those whose intellectual development took me in a direction where I think that markets do more than, than socialism to help the poor. I know there are differences of opinion on that. But I wanted to make it clear that you understand I am on the free market side after all my guests at the conservative club of, of Bucknell. I don't think they'd like it if I came up here and said, surprise, I'm a socialist. So, okay. So what I'd like to do, though, uh, is, you know, there, there are different approaches as to what to do for the poor. and. Bernie Sanders did a very effective job of raising the issue of economic inequality and bringing it to the forefront during his, his campaign. So as soon as I can get this unmuted here, I'm going to play a four-minute clip from Senator Sanders' talk. This was a campaign speech he gave at Liberty University in Virginia a little over a year ago. It's a, it's a Christian university, so you'll hear him refer to the Bible. I'm going to give Senator Sanders four minutes because I think he can deliver his message better than I can do it for him. I think he deserves to, to be his own spokesman. Told you I was low tech. Amos 5.24 But let justice roll on like a river righteousness like a never-failing stream. Justice, treating others the way we want to be treated. Treating all people, no matter their race, their color, their stature in life, with respect and with dignity. Now here is my point. Some of you may agree with me and some of you may not. But in my view, it would be hard for anyone in this room today to make the case that the United States of America, our great country, a country which all of us love, it would be hard to make the case that we are a just society or anything resembling a just society today. In the United States of America today, there is massive injustice in terms of income and wealth inequality. Injustice is rampant. We live, and I hope all of you know this, in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. But most Americans don't know that because almost all of that wealth and income is going to the top 1%. Now, that's the truth. We are living at a time, and I want all of you, if you would, put this in the context of the Bible, not me, in the context of the Bible. We are living at a time where a handful of people have wealth beyond comprehension. And I'm talking about tens of billions of dollars enough to support their families for thousands of years with huge yachts and jet planes and tens of billions. More money 
than they would ever know what to do with. But at that very same moment, there are millions of people in our country, let alone the rest of the world, who are struggling to feed their families. They are struggling to put a roof over their heads, and some of them are sleeping out on the streets. They are struggling to find money in order to go to a doctor when they are sick. Now, when we talk about morality, and when we talk about justice, we have to, in my view, understand that there is no justice when so few have so much and so many have so little. Okay. Uh, that's Mr. Sanders' remarks. He made his case very eloquently. He, he raised a couple of issues that are dear to the hearts of Americans and always have been important to us. He was talking about equality in, in, in the economic sense. He was talking about justice. These are two themes that resonate with Americans. And I'm going to talk about and elaborate, I'm going to try to give you some context and different perspectives to elaborate on these two themes. And then to add discussion of a third theme, which is the theme of opportunity. So that'll be the focus of the talk tonight. And you will see that at key points in the talk, Rather than me presuming to pronounce some sort of declarative answer and say, this is it, I'll be framing things in terms of questions. There are questions that you need to think more deeply about. And attending such a fine university, you have the opportunity to explore some of these ideas in, in your, your courses and in discussions with other students. How much or why? That's the key question. A lot, a lot, Mr. Piketty, with his book that Tom was telling you about in the introduction, he was trying to focus on the measure of, well, how unequally is wealth distributed? Another way of looking at this is to ask, why is wealth unequally, distri uh, unequally distributed? Is, is there something inherently unjust about that? You know, how, and how unequal is the subject to debate? Mr. Piketty himself withdrew, you know, he retracted his own data from the book. There are all sorts of ways of measuring this, but I prefer to look at why. And I'm, I'm not an egalitarian. I'm not obsessed with everybody having exactly the same amount of money. But why is economic inequality a reality, and is it just or unjust? And here, as an economist, I have to throw in a little economic truth. This is Carl Menger's subjective theory of value that was promulgated in the 1870s. When, when we trade, when we engage in an economic exchange, we trade unequals. If you're buying a used car for $5,000, you would rather have, you value the car more than the 5,000, or you wouldn't pay it. And the seller values the 5,000 more than the car, or he wouldn't sell it. That's what makes the world go around, is, is that we value things differently. And when these exchanges, when these transactions are voluntary, that is, nobody puts a gun to your head, but this guy chooses to do it, this gal chooses to do it, they make an exchange. Those voluntary exchanges are what we call positive sum because both sides are gaining. You know, in, in free exchange, both sides gain because if one side wasn't gonna gain, there would be no transaction. So it, it's just a truism that, that, they're gonna ex that the exchanges will be positive sum. And we do value things and including the product of human labor differently. That explains differences of wealth and income. I'm going to show you here. Maybe one of you guys can show me how to get rid of the, I keep forgetting in the PowerPoint how to get rid of the margin of the side. But I'm gonna tell you about a couple kids from my neighborhood. We were mostly boys. Three of us were lefties. And I was the lucky lefty. I didn't have to learn how to play a musical instrument. I now regret that. The other two did, and they played their instruments right-handed. My buddy Rick, just talked to him a couple weeks ago. 
He's been a violinist with the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra. He practiced very hard as a young guy. And living four houses down from me, the other guy is Glenn. And he was a pianist back then, but he later picked up the guitar, played the guitar right-handed even though he was a lefty. Now, I don't know how many of you recognize Glenn's photograph. Here he is when he was younger. We, he passed on earlier this year. I'm sorry, we, we lost him. I, I, I miss him. He was just an all-around good guy. But you see, he put together a group called the Eagles and became a multi-multi-millionaire. Whereas my friend Rick, who practiced just as hard with his instrument, was just as dedicated and very, very talented, only has earned a fraction of the wealth that Glenn Fry earned. There's nothing inherently unjust about that. Because how did this disparity in wealth, how did this income inequality happen? It happened as the result of the voluntary decisions of millions of consumers of music. You know, it wasn't that Glenn kept anybody from attending Rick's concerts with the symphony orchestra. It was simply that people were more willing to pay money to buy an Eagles album or go to an Eagles concert than a concert at the end of the symphony orchestra. So the economic difference between the two of them was simply the result of voluntary choices made by millions of free consumers. Here's another case of somebody who's a lot richer than your typical American. Nobody begrudges him his wealth. He didn't rip anybody off. He just provided a, an entertainment value that a lot of people were willing to pay for, King James. And then, I don't think it came out in the introduction, but I, as I said before, I'm a Detroit boy, so you know, Miguel Cabrera, one of the best hitters on the planet, we've got him, and he's very, very rich. But again, it's because people voluntarily pay to see this guy hit a baseball. Serena Williams, the great tennis talent of her generation. <coughs> uh, this is uh, Jennifer Lawrence. I had to look, I don't go to a lot of movies anymore, so I had to look up who was a, a high grossing actress. And Jennifer Lawrence, I guess, makes about $50 million a year. George Ackerman. <coughs> Nobody in here has heard of him. He's a Nobel Prize winner in economics. And the irony is, obviously, it's a Nobel Prize winner. He's got more education under his belt than any of those other people I've shown you. He's also the poorest. I mean, he's a millionaire. Because, you, know, you, you win a million bucks when you win the Nobel Prize. But he's not a multi-multi-millionaire like Glenn Fry, Serena Williams, Miguel Cabrera, etc. So uh, there, there's a little moral in the story for you college students, and that is, you know, it, it's not how much how many academic credits you accumulate that's going to ultimately determine your earning power. It's what value you deliver in the marketplace. And, and it may be that your academic credentials will help you do that. I think that will be the case for most of you. But there are a lot of people without academic credentials who still find ways to deliver value in the marketplace. Also, I chose Mr. Akerlof among other Nobel Prize economists because he's one of the few Nobel Prize winners who's less famous than his spouse. Anybody know who George Akerlof is married to? Who's, who's one of the most famous women in America? That's about his age. Janet Yellen, the head of the Federal Reserve System. And this young lady is Sarah Blakely, who was on, I took this photograph off the cover of Forbes magazine three or four years ago, at which time she was declared the youngest self-made female billionaire in America. Now what did she do? She came up with a company called Spanx. They, they make women's underwear. But she's added some improvements to it that have made it very, very popular. She's a billionaire, not because she ripped anybody off, but simply because she provided something that was of value to millions of her fellow beings. So there's great disparity in income that happens not as the result of anything nefarious or objectionable, but just in the matter of everyday life with Americans freely choosing what they like and what they don't like. So I, I, I think, you know, I would say to the egalitarians, slow down, don't, don't condemn it wholesale, because, you know, there's a reason, there are legitimate reasons, there are benign reasons why there's disparity in income. Just a temporary conclusion here, in economic matters, we are unequal. That's the natural state of things. So this does lead to a normative question. Big question number one, okay? This is for you to answer, not me. Big question number one. 
Because we have these natural differences that result in these disparities in income, because people have different talents and people value things differently, we have to ask, is this natural economic order of things defective? Is it, is it fatally flawed? Did the creator, whatever your concept of the creator is, did the creator blow it? You know, is, is, is the universe defective and therefore human governments should try to eradicate the differences, the natural differences in our economic output and our economic valuations? Should the government oversee what we buy and say, no, 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 you're consuming too much rock music, you should get some more classical music, whatever. I mean, I hope you're, you're seeing that a certain amount of inequality is, is, is natural and um, you know, if, if you accept the premise, though, that that's wrong, then you're talking about changing the whole fabric of the universe. That's a tall order. In, in literature, just a few places where you can read about equality and inequality, and probably my favorite is Kurt Vonnegut's short story, Harrison Bergeron. You can read it in 10 minutes. It's, it is a short story. Brilliant. Written by, you know, a very liberal, humane author, and he took it, he did what's called the reductio ad absurdum. He took when government tries to enforce equality to the nth degree, what happens? In the Bible, you can read the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, and you see that there was an unequal distribution. And actually, at the end of it, the, per the person who only had the one talent had that talent taken from him and given to the one who had turned the five into ten. Jesus, I'm not trying to make a, a theological statement that Jesus was preaching redistribution of wealth from the bottom to the top. Not at all. That wasn't what it was about. But it dealt with the, the inherent issue of inequality. I mean, people are different. Plato's Republic had to do with people being different. Obviously, it's Brave New World. It's a little bit more sinister in that one. And George Orwell's Animal Farm, of course, the Theo classic there. What happens when egalitarian ideas are taken to an extreme? Well, you end up with something like Maoism, which is exceedingly barbaric. And you see that everybody was dressed in the identical Mao suits. Because Mao treated human beings as if they're fungible. That's a fancy economic term meaning interchangeable. You know, a pound of copper is a pound of copper. The two pounds are fungible. They're completely interchangeable because there's no fundamental difference between them. You can't say that about two human beings. We're all different. People aren't fungible. But Mao treated human beings as if they were fungible, that we're all the same. And his record was nasty. Um, just in the Great Leap Forward, in the late 50s, early 60s, 38 million Chinese died. It, nobody knows the exact death total under Mao's egalitarian policies, but there's a good chance that it was close to 100 million people. Millions more killed in labor camps, purges, they were murdered. One time he even bragged about burying alive 46,000 scholars. He was afraid of the ancient wisdom. And then Deng Xiaoping, the reformer, came along. And he jettisoned the radical egalitarianism of Mao. He says, you know what? We've got this problem in China, it's called poverty. And we're gonna do something about it. We're going to get rich. And furthermore, some of us are going to get rich before others. And it wasn't that he was saying this is just or unjust. He was, he was recognizing this seems to be the way the world works. Nobody has ever figured out how to flip a switch and make everybody more prosperous equally at the same time. It just can't be done. When people are made the same, they, they can be made the same by leveling them down, but not by making everybody richer at the same time. At least this was... Deng Xiaoping's philosophy, and it's been carried out for the last 40 years, and look at what's happened. Annual income in mainland China, when Mao went to his reward in September 1976, annual per capita income, $163, about 50 cents a day. 2014, almost $7,600. You know, the Chinese alone have lifted close to $700 billion. 700 billion people out of poverty over the last few decades. Now, there, I've got a lot of problems with some of China's policies. Okay? I'm not trying to be a big cheerleader for everything they've done, but nobody in history has lifted that many people out of poverty that fast. And it wasn't done with egalitarian policies. It was done with specifically anti-egalitarian policies. Now, here's a question. 
Okay, question number two. What would you prioritize? Reducing wealth inequality or reducing poverty? Now, maybe you'd like to do both at once, but that doesn't seem to be how the world works. The world doesn't always cooperate with our theories. And one of the objections, or the, one of the points I encountered in Tom Piketty's book, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, is he seems to think that the 1930s was a better decade economically than the 1980s. Because what's important to him is reduction, you know, statistical reductions in wealth inequality. And that did happen in the 1930s. The wealth inequality shrank. Whereas in the 1980s, wealth inequality increased. But let's look at the context. Let's look at what happened to real, live human beings. The 30s had the Great Depression. It's the only time in American history where life expectancy bogged down. Whereas in the 80s, we had a boom. And yes, there was more wealth inequality, but the poverty rate fell by one-sixth in five years. Compared to all that economic suffering of the 1930s, the 80s were so much better for the poor, even at the expense of rising inequality. African Americans in the 1980s, now were they all helped? No, that never, no segment of the population, no demographic slices all helped at once. But the number of African-American-owned businesses rose 40% in that decade. The real income rose 17% in, in, in seven years. That's real inflation-adjusted income. College enrollment increased 30%. You see the unemployment rate fell faster for African-Americans than for, for white Americans. And there was a 40% increase in households earning $50,000 a year or more. Now, I'm not trying to say the 1980s was heaven on earth or the best time ever. But if you care about poor people, there was more real progress made against poverty in the 80s than in the 30s. And if that's the price you have to pay, and if you have to have more inequality, but fewer poor people. See, I, I'm concerned about the poor people. I like it when there are less poor people, because I've seen the suffering of poverty. And so, but this is one of these differences of opinion. So you have to decide what's more important to you, reducing inequality or reducing poverty. I can kind of speed through this in the interest of time. You know, we, we hear startling figures. The, the union, the AFL-CIO, said CEO to worker pay ratio was 331 to 1. That's a very startling, inflammatory number. But they cherry pick. They only took 350 of the top CEOs, you know, the CEOs of Apple, and Microsoft, and Exxon, and uh, Walmart, and companies like that. But guess what? According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are a lot of companies, and many of them are small. There are almost a quarter of a million CEOs in America with the average pay being 178000 Now, if some of them are making 5 or $10 million a year, that means to get the average this high, you've probably got some that are only making twenty or 30000 You probably have some CEOs of small businesses who don't have a net gain to show for a year. The average worker pay during that time was 35239 so the actual... CEO to employer ratio is five to one. Now, again, is this too much? I don't know, that, that, that's arbitrary. How, is, is three to one too much? Is 10 to one too much? You can debate that if you want, but I'm, I'm saying it's not as extreme. So watch about being manipulated by statistics, because statistics can be manipulated in a lot of ways. So here's big question number three. Senator Sanders was basically saying that this unequal distribution of wealth is unjust. Is unequal wealth inherently unjust? Now I ask a startling question, is Jesus the savior of mankind? Why do I put that in there? Because it's a matter of belief. I, I can't tell you what to believe. You need to ponder these issues and decide what side of the fence you're gonna come down on, okay? Now I can't tell you what's right but I can try to show you some of the costs of pursuing egalitarian policies. Political costs, economic costs, ethical, and sociological. So let's start with the political consequences, okay? Now historically, most human beings 
have gotten left out by the governments under which they live. You know, the European governments, the African governments, the Asian governments. You had an elite at the top reading the laws so that they got most of the wealth. The political power translated into economic power, a big slice of the pie. In Europe, you had feudalism and mercantilism. Those were systems where the few at the top rigged a system where they profited, and the masses of people were extremely poor. They were left out. They were shut out. Socialism is the same way, you know? I mean, we talk, socialism is the brotherhood and equality of all people, but in practice, it's only a few people at the top deciding what the country produces. I have, I have a Russian friend who defected. He was an economist. He was part of a bureau of 325 bureaucrats who determined the 23 million prices in the Soviet Union. Imagine, I mean, that's more price. They could only revisit a price every five years. And it was, there was no flexibility in their economy at all. Political consequences. Look, if you have a government powerful enough to pick economic winners and losers, it's going to be an oppressive government. And we've seen that throughout history. And, and, and here's what I would encourage all of you, conservative or liberal. You know, if you have idealistic assumptions about government reform, and you think, okay, I'm gonna vote, I'm gonna get my person elected, and I'm gonna give them this power, and they're gonna fix the world. Don't assume that when you give these people this power, they're gonna use it in the way that you think they're gonna use it. Once politicians have power, they tend to use it for their own agendas. Just word to the wise there. The economic consequences of egalitarian policies, well, high taxes, we see this already. I mean, you've got corporate inversions, you've got American businesses fleeing, going abroad. You've got citizens renouncing their citizenship just to get away from the high taxes in this country. It's ironic because historically, People came to the United States to escape high taxes. Now the shoe's on the other foot, and they're, they're getting out of the states to escape high taxes. We even see this within the United States, with people migrating from high tax states to the low tax states. And the Marxian principle to each according to his need diminishes incentives for production, self-improvement, and advancement. Now I say remember Plymouth and Jamestown. I'm referring to those English-speaking colonies that were started on the eastern seaboard around 1620. Do you know that in both of those colonies there was starvation? And the Smithsonian Institution figured out a couple years ago, they found the proof there was actually cannibalism in Jamestown. And the reason was, is they had collective ownership of the land and the crops. All the crops were put in the <coughs> store and the citizens were told, hey, it belongs to all of us equally. There's egalitarianism for you. So everybody said, okay, I can go in the winter and get it. Well, they said, it was July and August though, and they thought, man, it's hot and humid today. I don't work. I, I, I'm gonna take the day off. It's okay, because I'll just still get my corn in the winter. But so many people got lazy that there wasn't enough that was grown, and they started. And, and those colonies only survived and began to prosper when they jettisoned collective ownership and instituted private property. And the governor said to each citizen, this is your acreage. Whatever you grow on it is yours. And if you don't grow anything on it at all, you have no claim to anybody else's. Sink or swim, they swim. And redistribution consumes capital. And here I want to salute Senator Sanders. I don't know that he intended to, but he basically stated an economic truth when he said, the rich have more money than they could possibly spend. Yes, thank goodness. It's the fact that they don't need to spend it that blesses the rest of us. This forms part of the capital base of the economy that finances the construction of new factories, new businesses, and puts more people to work and enables them to climb out of poverty through well-paying jobs. Capital is essential to the economic welfare of a society. Could capital be of greater benefit to the poor than to the rich? Absolutely. Economic point number two, the essential role of capital. Workers need capital. Capital increases the productivity of labor and therefore the wages of labor and standards of living. Ludwig von Mises, the professor of my professor, in one of his books said, 
a country becomes more prosperous in proportion to the rise in invested capital per unit of its population. The more capital per capita, the richer a country is, the higher the standards of living. Jesse Jackson, you don't see him quoted at a lot of conservative lectures, do you? Capitalism without capital is just another ism. It doesn't matter if you're a socialist or a capitalist, in a modern economy, you have to have capital. It's an essential ingredient. And the capital comes from deferring present consumption. So the rich people that earn so much money, more money than they could possibly spend, what do they do? They can invest it. Now, now some of them give it away, which is their prerogative. After all, it's their property. But we should be grateful for their investment. And traditionally, the Marxists say, oh, capital is the horrible exploiter of human beings. Well, if that were true, then the countries where there was the most capital invested would be the country where the workers were most wretched. Can anybody out there tell me what country has had more capital per capita invested in it than any other? I got bad news for you American college students. You've been horribly exploited. There's been more capital invested in the United States than anywhere else. And that's why we're richer than anywhere else. You know, the, the Marxian idea that capital devastates nations, if that were true, we would be devastated. USA, okay? The ethical implications of egalitarian policies, all right? The high tax rates on honestly earned profits, you know, the, this idea of let's, let's go after the corporations that are making billions of profits. What are you doing? You're going after those who have created the most wealth for others. Remember, exchanges are positive sum, voluntary exchanges. The corporations that make the most money are the corporations that have supplied the most value for other Americans lifting their standards of living. Those are society's benefactors. Why do, why do you want to penalize them? And then, of course, there's the idea of unequal treatment for the law. You know, the only way to make everybody economically equal is to treat them unequally. And so you have to decide which theory of justice you're more comfortable with. So here I was anticipating this slide when I was talking about the, the reality of profits, that business <coughs> profits mirror consumer benefits. See, businesses profit by creating value for others. It's not that they seize it. It's not that they rip anybody off. They produce a product or a service that somebody else wants and values and willingly pays for. Profits are earned economically, not extracted politically. And now, in our system today, we don't have a completely free market system. We've got a lot of cronyism. And that's one of the things that bugs me about Peaky. I mean, here he's talking about justice all the time. And he's silent about cronyism. I think cronyism is, is an injustice because cronyism is where the government picks favorites. It picks winners and losers, just like the old feudal system did, just like the old mercantilist system, just like socialism does. It picks the winners and losers. Well, that's what cronyism does. That's not a free market. When the government bestows a special benefit on a particular business, you and I aren't getting that benefit. Why is this business? Because of their political connections. I think that needs to stop. And I'm appalled that some of my egalitarian colleagues in the economics profession remain silent about this horrible thing. Sociological implications of egalitarian policies. Okay? They, they, they tend to demonize and disrespect innocent people. There was a, a young co-ed on, on uh, television last year on one of Neil Cavuto's program. Uh, she said, doing nothing, the, the rich people do nothing to contribute to the progression of society. Wait a minute, how did they become rich? By contributing to the progression of society. You know, they didn't find their money, they earned it by creating wealth. And because they've accumulated wealth, that's, that's not doing anything negative to, to the students. And traditionally, America has been a a relatively peaceful society. It's always been rambunctious. But we've learned the genius of America is peaceful, voluntary cooperation in the marketplace. You know, we have our religious differences. We worship in different ways or don't worship at all on the weekends. But in the daily commercial life, the rest of the week, we're just all helping each other prosper. 
I will show you. I do think that historically class warfare has never taken hold here because classes are so fluid. People born poor can go from rags to riches in America. I'll, I'll explain that later too. There are other theories of justice other than just redistributing wealth. You know, Galatians in the Bible, you reap what you sow. And where Marx said that, well, it, we should have a system where it's to each according to his need, under capitalism, Mises called it to each according to his accomplishments. Isaiah, they shall not plant and another eat. Frederick Bastian viewed justice rather negatively. It just means there's an absence of injustice. Nobody's rights are being violated. Adam Smith, the moral philosopher, sometimes known as the father of modern economics. Justice is a negative virtue that only hinders us from hurting our neighbors. Don't do bad things to other people. Now, if the rich take from the non-rich, then you've got injustice. And feudalism, mercantilism, and socialism are all examples where those who have the power take the wealth. And the mercantilist philosophy was very flawed, and we, we, we see it being resurrected today. It's, it's quite prevalent in the progressive movement. We have the, this notion that the only way somebody gets a profit is to extract it from somebody else. My gain is his loss. No. Involuntary transactions, they're positive sum, not zero sum. But it seems that they're focused now on the left on policies where the only way they want to help somebody else is by taking something from somebody. Let's get beyond this notion that we have to hurt somebody and take something from somebody in order for somebody else to be helped. The historical exception would be real capitalism, not this cronyism we have today, which is a complete counterfeit. But we had a relatively free market for our, our first century or so. That's the only place where markets haven't been rigged and where anybody was free if they had the ability and the initiative to prosper. And remember Sarah Blakely, the woman who started the underwear company? She hasn't ripped off before. Capitalism involves success in serving others. There are clear injustices that we should all unite against. Government spending our retirement eggs. I think, uh, I think what government has done with Social Security and the jeopardy it's placed on the young generation, I think that's unjust. The tens of trillions of debts and unfunded liability that you are being bequeathed, I think that's unjust. The depreciation of our currency, the Federal Reserve manipulation of interest rates to zero, where if you save, you don't get compensated for it anymore because interest rates are microscopically small. Cronyism. Look, there's a lot of injustice that, uh, conservative or liberal, we can unite, I think, to try to put an end to these injustices. Now let me talk, to, okay, we've talked about equality, we've talked about injustice. Let me just talk a little about opportunity, which I consider the key to progress. And I think you need jobs. And job opportunities tend to be most plentiful during times of economic growth. Again, one of my complaints, one of the reasons I wrote this book, taking apart Piketty's book, because he has this blind spot. He hardly ever talks about economic growth. Well, how are you going to help the poor? How are you going to uplift standards of living without economic growth? That doesn't explain. We, we cannot be silent. We have, we have to have growth. So here, now here's a big question for you. What causes poverty? And that might be a backwards way of putting it. Maybe we need to ask what causes wealth? Because poverty is actually the natural state. You know, human beings are born and they don't come with a lifetime supply of goods next to them. And there has to be production throughout their life to support the human life. So let's go on and take a look at this. We do know something about persistent causes of poverty. These have been identified. Okay, so here we're getting into more scientifically solid stuff. And the census data shows these factors are really crucial to poverty. Dropping out of high school, staying single, having children without a spouse, and working part-time or not working at all, those are what, those are the be behaviors that tend to be associated with poverty. Here's education level, okay? You see on the left, the, the, the tall bar did not complete high school. Well, those folks are much more likely to experience long-term poverty. Higher education is only 1.2%. 
And those are probably people maybe with substance abuse problems, emotional problems, whatever. But you can see that by and large, you get an advanced education, chances are you're not getting poor. Now, since education is so important to climbing out of poverty, what can government do? Here's another big question for you. We need to think about this. What can government do to keep kids in school? Now, sometimes you hear people say, well, you know, there's there are poor people in the inner city, let's raise taxes on the rich. Well, that, you know, if you're doing that to redistribute income to help somebody in the short term because they're poor, that's, that's one thing, but it doesn't address the root causes. If, if the root cause of long-term poverty is somebody dropping out of school, how does raising taxes on the rich or anybody else keep them in school? It, 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 it doesn't fit. And it's a hard problem. I mean, what do you, you know, should we have police enforce truancy laws? I don't know. Another factor contributing to poverty is family structure. You can see data, oh, it's 10 years old now, but it's roughly the same. When families are intact, the poverty rate is less than 10%. But the poverty rate for unmarried mothers with children is 40% versus 8% for married couples with children. What a huge disparity, 40% versus 8%. So a reasonable conclusion from this, as Robert Rector of the Heritage Foundation has said, marriage is America's greatest weapon against child poverty. And the statistics seem to confirm that. But again, big question time. What can or government should government do to fix families? Raise taxes on corporations? Yeah, this is a crucial issue. What can the government do? I don't know. Start a Bureau of Marriage and Families? Another reason for Same sex marriages. <laughs> okay, that's another one. The top 20% as measured by household income have on average the equivalent of two full-time workers, and the bottom 20% have on average 0.4 workers. Does it surprise any of you that a household with two full-time workers is gonna have more income than a household with 0.4 of a worker? You work more, you're gonna earn more. Now, should we raise taxes on the top 20%? Is it, is it because they're both working that somebody else isn't working? Usually not. Government welfare programs. This is something we need to rethink, and here's why. I consider this the most scandalous economic chart in American public policy. That blue line that starts back about 1947, that's going down, 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 that's the poverty rate in America. The red line at the bottom is government spending to address poverty. Well, when did the war on poverty get launched? The mid 60s? By 1970, those programs had become well established. And look what happened from 1970 on. The red line of government spending upon poverty kept going up and up and up. We kept spending more and more and more. And the blue line, measuring the rate of poverty in the country, just kind of gravitates around the level. It's, it's, it's like it's, it hasn't quite flatlined, but we've essentially 40, 50 years ago, we essentially halted the progress against poverty in this country. Here's another uh, graph that comes from the Secretary of State's office here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The highest welfare cliff, you see the red arrow up there, that's an income of 29,000 a year for a single mother with children. Well, what happens when she gets promoted at work and gets a raise? She starts paying more taxes and losing various government benefits. Her lifestyle, her net income, falls all the way until she makes 69,000. So what incentive does that give for a single mother to work hard and advance in the career? She gets penalized every time she makes a step forward. Perverse incentives. Some dollar figures for welfare spending. It was almost a trillion dollars last year. Now, if you do some math, the number of Americans defined as poor, if it was 46 million, I think this year it's 43 million, but okay, 46 million 
You divide up the money spent on them, that's $87,000 per family of four. Guess what? A family of four with $87,000 of income is far from poor. But of course, those households of four poor people, they're not getting anywhere near $87,000. So we gotta ask the question, where does all that money go? And the total taxpayer spending on the war on poverty, $22 trillion, more than three times the money spent on all U.S. wars and larger than our national debt. So I would submit to you that whatever the causes of poverty and persistent poverty, don't, blame the, don't say that the American taxpayer has been undertaxed. Not when we spent three times as much on the war on poverty as all our wars combined. It's not that Americans have been stingy. It's that what we've been doing hasn't been working. We just need to rethink it. We're getting a very poor return on our investment. We need a healthy job market. Here's another problematical graph. The blue line is the birth of US businesses. You can see going back to 1977, the blue line is above the red line, which is the line of business closures. We've always had a healthy job market because we've always had more businesses being created than businesses closing their doors for good. Except, in the last decade, you see that the rate of new business formation fell quite a bit, and a lot of that time is lower than the death rate. In other words, businesses started dying at a faster rate than they were being created. That's not good for the job market. And you see that we have this low labor participation rate. Now that's February. I looked at it for September, it was 62.8%. You can see how in the last 16 years, the percentage of Americans of work age that are actually working has been plummeting. It's a very serious problem. I mean, there, there are people not working, or they're, they're still consuming the wealth of this country, but they're not adding to the production of it themselves. And without them working, they're not earning an income, so they're probably poor. The burden of government regulation on our businesses, we rank 82nd out of 144 countries. If we want to have more vigorous business growth so that we have a more vigorous job market, let's reduce the regulatory burden. It's hugely costly, almost $15,000 per year per household. The regulatory costs are higher for smaller firms on a per capita basis because of the lack of economies of scale. This is something I just wanted to show you guys. Remember I said maybe there's a class warfare we need to watch out for that's emerging here in the United States? And it has to do with the federal bureaucracies. You know, we have a, an elected Congress that passes our laws, but we also live by many rules that are issued by the federal bureaucracies, the unelected bureaucrats in the executive branch of government. This photograph was taken by a congressman in his office. Those two and a half stacks of that thin, thin paper with a thousand words per page, those are the federal regulations, rules that we all have to comply with that were issued in one year by the unelected bureaucrats. You see the small stack of papers on top of the shelf on the right side? Those were the laws passed by our elected representatives in Congress in the same year. We're living by, we've got a lot more rules governing us that are being created by unelected bureaucrats who are unaccountable to us than by our elected representatives in Congress. That's not Democratic or Republican, small r. And look at the difference in pay. Federal government civilian pay and benefits is the blue line. The private sector equivalent is way below it. And that's why five of the seven richest counties in America are the counties that surround Washington, D.C. So, I mean, I do think we've got two classes emerging, the, the rulers and the ruler. We've got the highest corporate tax rate in the world, and that ends up hurting the wages of workers. If we had the lowest rate, I, I was on NPR a couple years ago debating this with somebody from the Center for American Progress, um, I said, look, you know, let's abolish the corporate rate. Everybody says it, all the economists agree it's, it's the most inefficient tax in the world, and it reduces worker pay. 
And if we're concerned about jobs in America, well, we've got companies trying to leave America because of our high tax rate. If we went from high, having the highest tax rate in the developed world to the lowest tax rate in the developed world, every multinational company in the world would try to set up shop in America. You would have such an explosion of job opportunities. Your, your generation would, would be rolling in clover. It would be fantastic. And the guy said to me, well, how, how, how would you pay for abolishing the corporate income tax? Because they raise about $300 uh, billion a year from it. I said, well, that's easy. Stop giving out the 300 billion of cronyism that you give out every year. And he said, oh no, some of those subsidies are good. Can you imagine? I'm the free market guy speaking against business subsidies. Yeah, I'm supposed to be in the, in the hip pocket of corporate America. And I'm saying, abolish all the business subsidies. And here's this progressive dude saying, those are good, keep them. It's a funny world out there, you guys. Um, very hard to raise capital. You know, I told you we need capital. The, the regulations of Don Frank, Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, we, we've got a lot of fewer businesses being formed because they're having a hard time getting the capital. So my conclusions are basically that jobs are the key to economic advancement and social mobility. That's always been the way in America. We just need a healthier job market. And that means a healthier business climate. You know, we've got too many politicians in Washington who say, I'm the champion of the worker. Let's nail those businesses. Wait a minute, who's got the jobs? Businesses. I mean, let, let's realize that capital and labor can work together, that management and labor are, are partners in creating wealth. I do wanna encourage you to think about that government is largely powerless to cure poverty or to prevent the behaviors that lead to poverty. I mean, how do they get inside our lives and change the decisions we make? That, I don't know any government that can do that. So this inequality that we hear about, it, it, it is a big deal, but especially to those who are having a hard time getting ahead. And I would like it not to be a big deal, and I think the way it will cease to be a big deal in our political discourse will be when our economy is really humming and growing, and there are abundant job opportunities, and, and people of all income levels <coughs> are prospering. I think if, we, if, if, if the poor can climb out of poverty, that to me is a, a much more humane goal than just worrying about some arid statistical abstract or measure of, of, of equality versus inequality. So I'll stop there and take your questions. Uh,